Okay, well, we've got 23 people on the call now, so let's make a start. So welcome. Um, nice to have so many people on. As I was saying, this has been recorded, so if anybody doesn't, doesn't want to uh, appear on YouTube, then please um, don't um, put your camera on or something. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, we've, I think this is enough time now. It's, it's a minute past, so if anybody else joins, I'll let them in at the appropriate time. Um, hope everyone's safe and well. We're now into our second lockdown. Hope everyone's doing okay with the, the COVID thing. Um, and uh, we're doing okay. Uh, I think this is our eight or ninth session now on Zoom, so this is becoming quite the norm now. I think it's uh, working pretty well, and um, great to have some really good speakers on. Um, we've got a few videos from some of our previous sessions on YouTube. Please check them out. Um, we've got yeah, twenty three people on tonight. Um, so thank you all for joining. We've got a few visitors from from other clubs as well as people from Sutton and Cheam. Everyone's welcome along tonight. We've got a great speaker. We've got Bob Burns, who some of you probably know and some of you perhaps don't know. Bob G three O U is a Bob spent many years as an RF design engineer and later on in life a software engineer. So a very technical chap and extremely competent. Uh, if you ever had the luxury of I haven't been lucky enough to go and see Bob's shack, you'll know that. Uh, most of the kit he uses in there, he's built himself and, uh, and it, it works very well and is built to a very high standard. So um, if you've got any questions, please let me know in the chat window and we'll bring you in at the appropriate time. Um, so Bob, I'm going to hand things over to you and you. Um, good luck and uh, let me just uh, make you the focus of the, uh, the video, wherever you go, there we are. Okay, Bob, over to you. Right, thank you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, topic for tonight is dead bug construction techniques and I'm going to go through what it is, how you use it, some worked examples. I don't seem to be able to change my slideshow for some reason. Let me just unshare the screen and start it again. Maybe that will be better. View slideshow. All right, that's working fine. Okay, um, sorry about that. So um, yes, we'll look through what it is, um, what the advantages and disadvantages are. And I've got some examples Unfortunately, uh, via Zoom, I can only show pictures of them, but hopefully they'll be clear enough. Um, and uh, then I have a, a picture at the end of my radio shack and test bench. So um, hopefully there's something to interest everybody. So um, dead bug. I, uh, I spent half of my working career as an RF designer. And I discovered very early on that if you go straight from a circuit diagram to a formal printed circuit board, you're liable to find something you missed and therefore causing you to have to have another printed circuit board made. And so I uh, adopted the uh, the old fashioned dead bug technology and then modified it a bit. And um, I'm going, I'll take you through the various stages. Really the first thing is to get the design right, at least as right as you can. And my favorite design aid is a pencil and a large pile of scrap paper and as I say at the bottom time spent in this phase will save time and costs either if you're a home constructor or whether you're a, a professional commercial engineer um, it saves a lot of time. So we've got a new design we hope it's going to work we need to establish whether it does or not and the uh, the basic techniques I've, I've um, bullet pointed here. As I said earlier, you can make a PC board with all the costs that entails. And um, whilst this may be the norm with digital printed circuit board designs, uh, because of the complexity and the fact that it's very difficult to, uh, to hand make uh, um, boards with lots and lots of connections on, particularly for multi-legged chips, then that's the norm. But um, in the RF world, it is much better to make a, a prototype with some description. Not ideal to use VeraBoard if you're um, at any sort of high frequency. Uh, doesn't offer very good ground track uh, facility. And quite often you'll find the whole thing will, will oscillate, give you all sorts of problems. 
um, prototyping jigs where you plug the components in, they're even less appropriate for RF. So that really leaves us with um, either uh, making a dead bug prototype or um, possibly using two pieces of 16 gauge wire and putting everything between them. But again, it's not ideal and you're, you're almost back to the Vero board type. So what is dead bug? I view it as a fast method of constructing a prototype without the main need to make a formal board. And if you're careful, because you're working on a continuous ground plane, uh, with short leads, it's possible to apply this method uh, up to at least 175 megs. And long time in the past, I did build a prototype per 432 meg converter using this technique, uh, which worked reasonably well. It's fast, it's efficient, it doesn't take long to make. You can make an RF circuit. Um, I've got some example circuits just to show you how you would go about it, but it is is very quick. Really, the uh, the important thing is to keep the uh, component lead short, and I'll show you how to um, very simply construct some uh, supply lines. It's probably not suitable for valves. It's uh, where the voltages are too high, but it's certainly uh, eminently suitable for solid state applications. And my uh, experience has been that you can eradicate most of the problems in uh, using your dead bug techniques and then go to a printed circuit board with a reasonably uh, high confidence that it will work. Right, why is it called dead bug? In the early days, a lot of the active devices were mounted upside down looks like a beetle with their legs in the air for the sake of argument. Um, unfortunately, this makes them difficult to manage. And if you need to change one, and of course it's, it's very easy to drop a screwdriver or um, poke the soldering iron in the circuit while it's still switched on and then have to um, eradicate the problems afterwards. But um, the modern technique is to mount the uh, components the correct way up with the leads pointing down and then um, splay them sideways. And if you're going to use multi-pin devices like ICs, uh, if you put them in a tin plated socket where the legs are flexible, unlike a, a turn pin socket where they're not, then you can, uh, again, you can um, bend the legs out sideways and then it's much easier to change the device. You simply pull it out of the socket. But you can still reach all of the uh, connections and you can mount the IC uh, socket very, very close onto the uh, ground plane. So good for at least 175 megs. You want to avoid long leads. So if you're going to use RF connections, then, um, uh, and I've just spotted the typo. There's a misspelling there. Um, apologies for that. Um, if you're going to use uh, signal paths, uh, 50 ohms, then of course you can use coax or you can use some strips of um, printed circuit board as microstrip. And that works quite well. It's quick and easy. It's faster and cheaper. You can probably make an amplifier on a um, a piece of uh, scrap printed circuit board in about 10 or 20 minutes. Making a printed circuit board would take considerably longer. It's easy to make changes and there's less risk of design failures in production because you're going to remove most of the problems. Um, not suggesting that you would have a problem with a single stage amplifier, but um, more complex, uh, like complete front ends of receivers or IF strips or whatever, then um, you can remove a lot of the problems, make it work reasonably well um, before you actually go to a proper printed circuit board. And I suppose this is the, the modern equivalent of using a, an old scrap chassis and, and uh, reusing valve holders and so on for prototyping um, circuits of many years ago. There are some disadvantages. Um, some components are more difficult to mount. 
particularly uh, printed circuit type um, shelters, presets or uh, adjustable uh, inductors. Not impossible, but you've got to take a little more care. Full screening between stages, not impossible, but it is more difficult. And the open construction does make it more susceptible to external influences and spurious signal radiation. They're all things you've got to take into account. It's a relatively flimsy structure. So you're going to have limited current and voltage capacity, and it's certainly not suitable for high voltage. Uh, it's entirely unsuitable for environments where some sort of vibration is present um, and it's not easily reproducible so it's no good for mass production so it is really um, a technique for one-offs having said that i've got one or two examples at the end that i made some years ago including a vfo for a four meter transceiver that was used in a car for some while right the first step, and I, what I've shown here is a single stage amplifier, and we have the advantage that there's no crossovers in the circuit, so it's relatively straightforward to make, and it would be extremely simple to make a printed circuit board for it. But uh, we're going to use this as a, just a very simple worked example, so that we can see how to start with um, the circuit diagram then a pencil version of the layout should it be needed this one probably isn't needed you can go straight to the uh, the prototype so the initial construction a piece of scrap printed circuit ball with a continuous copper layer and i i reuse my uh, prototypes many times so there's probably more lead more solder than there is copper on them but that's fine it's not a problem if you desperately need to clear the uh, solder off, you can um, take it somewhere safe and uh, heat it up in a blow lamp gently and the, uh, the excess solder will just run off. But not on the carpet, please. Right, um, you notice I'm using um, uh, supports, components for supports. Um, in my case, I have a large stock of 10 nanofarad disc ceramic capacitors, which have got quite thick leads and they make ideal mechanical supports and of course give a degree of decoupling at the same time. So if you need, um, let's say a plus nine volt or plus 12 volt line, whatever it may be, you can mount two capacitors on one edge of your scrap printed circuit board join it together with some 18 gauge tinned uh, copper wire and if you need a support in the middle just use another capacitor they're very cheap and very easy to use um, you could use tag strips i guess but um, the capacitors seem to work well and uh, are very easy and of course you can take the capacitors off put them back in the tin and reuse them next time if they haven't been damaged and i'm showing a, a continuous copper layer single-sided PC board is all that's wanted because we don't care what happens under the board. So here's um, my equivalent of a pencil layout of the uh, circuit. Very easy to do. The black blobs are solder joints to the ground plane and everything is simply me mechanically mounted on um, small capacitors. Resistors at the bottom are soldered to the ground plane keep the lead short. You may have to shuffle things around when you think about mounting the transistor or transistors depending on what the body type of the transistor is but again it's it's just common sense. If you're using a screen tuned circuit as I've shown here you can lay it parallel to the board and solder one of the uh, uh, the legs down to the printed circuit board. Just be careful to make sure that the supply line at the top which is shown in black is high enough above the tune circuit uh, encapsulation that you're not going to catch it with your trimming tool uh, or accidentally short the supply line at the same time so just a little bit of common sense is needed but as you see the, the circuit is very easy and there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't put multiple circuits on a suitably sized piece of board 
if you wanted to make a front end converter or whatever it is. Um, I have made an IF strip with 100 dB gain, but I did have to spread the circuits out a little bit and make sure that the inputs and outputs were well isolated and um, I could get that to run stably at 9 megahertz. Um, here's an example, a high frequency example. Uh, this is a very simple constant K low pass filter and the arrangement of the filter um, in the picture mimics the arrangement in the circuit diagram. So the M derived section uh, is the third in from the left. And this is a commercial filter I used to make many, many years ago um, for uh, 144 megahertz for harmonic suppression on a transmitter. Insertion loss about 0.3 of a dB, 0.4 of a dB, something of that order. Um, and the next slide will show you the frequency response of this open circuit. Sorry, go the right way. Right, there's the frequency response on my Regal analyzer. And apart from a slight dip just before the um, dissension into cutoff, which just requires the inductors to be tweaked slightly. As you can see, even though it's an open construction, uh, I've got a stop band which is uh, between 60 and 70 dB below the pass band. So for an open structure, that's not bad. There's a few spikes in the stop band. They're probably a casual pickup of signals because it's not entirely screened. But it establishes that uh, it's a good test at RF and it does work reasonably well. I didn't measure the insertion loss of this particular filter because I wasn't expecting perfection, but um, mounted in die-cast boxes, they, uh, they worked extremely well. So if there's any questions, just uh, enter a chat to our so host and Bob, he will... Good point we've got a couple of questions one let me just turn on let people just unmute if they want to now one second find the right option to do that there we go so adrian you've got a question about design do you want to ask your question if you could unmute yourself which hopefully you'll be able to do now adrian are you there yeah i'm here it's very very loud. Yeah, yeah my question is probably better. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll I'll read the question out, Adrian, if that's okay, because it's very loud. So Adrian's question was really have you ever have you used the PC to design PCBs and what software did you use? Um I have not uh, seriously used a PCB. Uh, and the rather feeble reason is that um I'm so used to doing um layouts on graph paper where you look at the underside of the PC board, in other words, the solder side rather than the component side. And there are very few PCB layout packages available that allow you a mirror facility. There is one whose name I forget at the moment, um, but uh, I've, I've found it um, so easy to do a graph paper layout and it's probably many years of um, doing that, that uh, I don't get on particularly well with PCBs and I tend to spend more time on design and the electronic side of things. So um, I've, I've often hinted that I'd like some help with uh, somebody taking on one of my graph paper layouts and turning it into a real PC board, but so far I've uh, unfortunately had no, um, no offers. Um, but I do have several very interesting circuits, including um, an H mode mixer from uh, PA3 AKE, which is um, works extremely well. I made a handmade board, but I would like to have a proper printed circuit board made. Um, does that answer your question or have I copped out? No, nope. Nedrin's nodding his head, so that's a good sign. We've got another question from, I think it's Paul G0TXL. Paul, do you want to unmute and see if you can, see if it works for you? Here we go. Oh, is that okay? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering whether you managed to use the technique with um, surface mount devices. Um, but there's a lot of devices now that are only available in SMT packages. Um, so it'd be quite handy to use some of them. Um, it looks 
rather problematic. Uh, right. Well, I can answer that because um, uh, yesterday I finished off a digital VFO uh, using the um, SI570 chip and I had a lot of problems soldering it onto the board. So when I was doing some prototype work, what I did was um, to solder some 30 gauge wire on the underside of the, uh, the oscillator chip and uh, I left them about a quarter of an inch long and soldered those down onto the um, proper printed circuit board. And this was really to try and track down a problem. So it is possible, but I agree that um, a lot of surface mount chips are very, very small and they don't lend themselves ideally. However, there is one possible solution and that is for an awful lot of chips. There are PC adapters available which allow you to solder the chip onto a little tiny PC board, which then has dual inline um, connector legs sticking out below and you can plug it into um, a, a, a PC socket. Now that obviously has a limited frequency uh, range, but nevertheless, certainly up to 100, 150 megs. I suspect you would probably get it to uh, work reasonably well. You just have to bear in mind the shortcomings of having longer connection leads. But if you're working at lower frequency, shouldn't be a problem at all. And those those adapter cards uh, are available. Some of them are very tiny. They're only uh, eight or 10 millimeters square, but they do provide you with a mounting arrangement so that a chip that's about three millimeters square or, or less, which disappears when you sneeze, um, could be eminently more easy to uh, to manage. Uh, yeah, so it's not just the size um, that I was, I was concerned about. A lot of the devices have got uh, thermal considerations where they've got pads underneath them um, that have to be soldered down to the board. Um, and that makes it very difficult actually to make, man even make a printed circuit board or, or assemble it. Um, but I was just thinking this might be a way around it if you could solder a uh, slightly heavier gauge wire to those pads and, uh, and, and use that to take the heat away. Yes, the other possibility that comes to mind is that you could, um, depending on the frequency of operation, you could use a, um, a piece of copper sheet cut suitably to size and bent in a U-shape, which would suspend the chip maybe eight or 10 millimeters above your prototype board and also provide some heat sinking facilities as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that's uh, probably not going to go away. It's, it's getting more difficult. So, um, yes, uh, I think, I think this falls in the, uh, in the digital example, which is you may have to take a risk and try and make a printed circuit board unless yeah. you can divide the circuit into sections and test those individually. OK, thank you. Any other questions um, at this stage, or sure, uh, if you have, uh, now is the time, if anyone's got any questions. Okay. Okay, I'll, um, I'll carry on. As I say, if anybody wants to object violently to what I say or has a query, just, uh, just flag it up with, uh, with Chris, please. Okay. Um, Right, I should be back on. Um, now, this is, uh, this is another example of what you can do. Now, I hasten to point out that this was not designed. It was thrown together. There was no intention of making this for a specific frequency. I simply got some wire and trimmers and um, put it onto a, a piece of scrap printed circuit board to see what it did. And um, the trimmers are 2 to 10 puff and the pieces of 18 gauge tin copper wire are about three inches long, 75 mils long or thereabouts. Um, and I put a couple of BNC sockets tapped down to actually see what it would do. And uh, the next slide is the frequency response, uh, which peaks uh, at um, 222 megahertz. So as you can see, um, it does provide a passable filter, but as I say, this is purely an exercise to see what was possible. Um, it wasn't a serious design. So if I were making this filter, 
uh, I would want to put um, some sort of screen in between the individual sections and I'd probably want to put a screen lid over the whole thing. So the stop band is uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, is nearly 50 dB below the peak. I've no idea what the insertion loss was. That wasn't the issue at the time. It's just to establish that at this sort of frequency, it is possible to make a filter which uh, has reasonable characteristics. And I, I have to say the Regal uh, spectrum analyzer with the tracking generator is um, a wonderful thing for testing filters. It's just so good, but it does have a limited stop band capability. Um, depending on the bandwidth of the circuit you're, you're trying to measure, um, it can become very slow if you want to uh, get the bandwidth of the analyzer down. So sometimes at uh, 100 hertz bandwidth, uh, it can take uh, 30 or 40 seconds to get the display to update. But on the other hand, it, uh, it works extremely well. Um, I've just about squeezed minus 80 dB from it, but it's getting quite difficult at that sort of level. And also it requires the device under test to be uh, in a screen box really, uh, which of course makes adjustment difficult. But nevertheless, it's, it's not bad at all. So it's a nice piece of kit, and I gather they're now appearing secondhand at quite uh, quite sensible prices compared to the new price, which I think was fourteen hundred when I bought mine, and uh, I believe the new price is now down nearer a thousand. Um, the sideband noise isn't particularly good on them, but the Siglent equivalent, which costs a little more, um, I think the sideband noise is about twenty dB better. So. That's, uh, that's a nicer instrument to use. Right, let's move on. I'm getting through this fairly quickly, so this may be less than an hour. Um, right, this is, um, again, just a very simple example of a TDA 2003 audio amplifier. As you can see, I've used some tag strips because some of the components are quite heavy. And you can see the 13-volt uh, the line at the top of the picture. Um, adequately decoupled with both ceramic capacitors and an electrolytic. So that sort of circuit, you could put the whole thing together in an hour from scratch, assuming you've got everything to hand, and um, a very easy way to check it. Bolt the um, bolt device onto the board, very simple heat sink for uh, short-term use, perfectly adequate. Uh, you've got short connections, so there shouldn't be any stability problems and uh, very quick to test the circuit and see if it works properly and once it does you can <clears throat> you can then go to a printed circuit board this is a rather more complex circuit it looks a mess <laughs> um, in the bottom right hand corner is a crystal set with the three gang tuning capacitor and the wearite um, media coil the rest of the circuit is a 7 meg superhet, which does both AM, SSB and CW. There's no significant IF filtering provided, um, but it does have AGC. I don't know if you can see the mouse here, but the RF stage is bottom left. The mixer is above it and the oscillator is next to it. And then there's um, three IF uh, tuned circuits and then there's a product detector and also um, a diode detector for AM and there's a very simple AGC system with the RF gain control which controls the AGC line in the middle. That covers 7 to about 7.3 megahertz. It'll resolve around a microvolt, one and a half microvolt, something of that order, uh, which is more than you need for 7 megs, particularly in the evening. Um, the AGC is a bit limited the object was to establish that the technique works with a complete receiver with quite a lot of gain. So there's probably 100 dB or thereabouts of gain overall. Um, but of course, there's two different frequencies involved and the IF is 455 kilohertz. So um, not too much feedback for the uh, closely mounted circuits. The supply line is across the top. It's um, This is probably about 15 years old now. Um, and it's been um, taken to many talks 
and it's showing signs of um, being battered and beaten about a bit. And then there's a little nine volt regulator, just a discrete xenodiode and a current amplifier on the top right. Um, and it, it establishes that you can uh, use the technique perfectly well at uh, HF frequencies without any issues. Um, there's a blown up picture of the front end. <clears throat> and as you can see, the um, tune circuits are mounted sideways on the board and the, the little lugs which would go through the printed circuit board in conventional construction the bottom one is soldered to the board and the supply line is that you're not going to cause any problems if you um, put your tuning tool in there and uh, and then slip don't use screwdrivers by the way of any sort for these sort of cores because you'll break the cores very easily indeed so you need a proper trimming tool Um, this is a more serious piece of kit, which uh, again I made 10 or 15 years back. Um, this is a log detector using the analog devices um, logarithmic uh, detector. The bottom left is the analog devices bit, the important bit. Um, the top left is a very simple high impedance buffer with pretty well unity gain. Uh, uses a junction FET as the input um, and then a, a bipolar device as the uh, the output stage so its output impedance is very low. Input impedance is roughly a meg in parallel with about 10 puff and I use that for doing uh, high impedance filter checks. The input impedance on the bottom left connector is 50 ohms so you can um, Put a signal generator via a filter into this and then the output is DC coupled. So again that's a more serious use of dead bug technology for a long-term project. So as long as it's um, not going to be subject to vibration it'll last for years. You'll notice there's a reverse protection diode there just to stop any silly accidents and um, a couple of voltage regulators. It runs off 12 to 13 volts so there's a 9 volt regulator in the middle for the um, the high impedance buffer and there's a 5 volt regulator for the uh, logarithmic amplifier. And then bottom right is the operational amplifier for um, tweaking the gain so that uh, in my case I've got it adjusted so that when the oscilloscope is correctly set I get 10 dB per division. So I can get um, just about get 80 dB dynamic range with it. Um, but it tends to, again, require some screening for the device under test. The screen box, the diecast box, is absolutely fine, but as soon as you connect an unscreened lead to the input, of course, you're going to pick up all sorts of stuff. And this is a very wideband device. It's not like the uh, spectrum analyzer, which is tuned to the frequency of um, operation. So um, if you're near somewhere near a, a, either a local ham transmitter or broadcast transmitter, um, you're going to find that it will pick it up very easily but it's a it's a very simple device to make works extremely well um, and uh, I've never had any stability issues with it at all uh, you must excuse the Belling and Lee connector on the bottom right I, I quite like those devices um, having had years of um, using phono connectors with some of my Heathkit gear which I think are the most abysmal connectors out um, I quite like the um, the Belling Lee sockets. They're, they've always been reliable for me. I would use them obviously at UHF, but uh, on the HF bands, I find they're absolutely fine, and and they're fine with a hundred watt transmitter as well. I've never had one heat up or catch fire on me yet. Right, this is a crystal mixer VFO. <clears throat> it generates um, an output. Um, to drive the mixer of a 70 meg receiver and again this was probably made about 25 30 years ago and it survived um, being run around in the car in the early days and is still working to this day it's uh, a vfo around seven or eight megahertz which is mixed with a crystal uh, controlled source and then balance mixer which is on the bottom right here 
this is a discrete balance mixer. This is from the days before we had SBL ones and so on. And um, then some simple tuned circuits and a buffered output. So it produces a few milliwatts of output, which is fine. So again, it's, um, it's a more serious application of the technique that I'm talking about. Um, this is taking the process to its logical conclusion. This actually is a pre-production of a, um, uh, a 7 watt AMPA block for 150 to 170 megahertz. And as you can see, the, uh, the dead bug technology has been applied, but on a, a slightly more formal printed circuit board. And uh, we made quite a lot of these. Um, the overall structure was improved a bit because the U-shape heatsink wasn't particularly effective. So we ended up turning the structure sideways and um, used a, uh, an aluminium block to mount everything on, uh, which was about um, half an inch thick and inch, inch and a half wide, something of that order. Uh, and that was then bolted onto the back panel of the mobile radio, with um, which had a proper thinned heatsink on it. So that, that technique, again, is perfectly reliable in production and uh, works okay in a, a car or lorry. And we never had any components falling off. So um, it, it, it seemed to be reliable. I can come back to any of the slides afterwards if you, if you want to have another look at them. Um, now, all of this leads up to the fact that I can uh, generally turn out reliable uh, equipment. Um, this is Heathkit Green, and um, probably less than half of these are genuine Heathkits. The rest have been homemade, um, but they look like Heathkit. I've had a few people that went to rallies and exhibitions when I, uh, who've turned up and said, oh, that's all Heathkit, and walked away again, and haven't bothered to look. But um, the majority of the items are homemade. You can see in the middle of the um, picture, just underneath my call sign block, is a dual Z match, which covers top band to two meters. The HF bit is on the left, the VHF bit's on the right. And I use that regularly um, today. Um, power supply, multi-rail power supply, um, 6.3, 12.6, uh, intended for valve use, um, and a variety of supply lines from minus 150 to plus 1100 volts. So it's a sort of general purpose power supply that would quite happily feed a, a transceiver, um, an old valve transceiver without any problems. Um, this is another power supply built in the Heath standard. There's another one up here. Um, the unit here that I'm pointing at, uh, left of center, is a switch box that enables me to switch the key, loudspeaker, um, and any monitoring equipment between one of up to four um, pieces of uh, either receiver or transceiver. So there's a series of screen switches inside. So that means that I can move the microphone and the key very quickly between different rigs. Uh, it's fine for the old fashioned gear where you don't have these intelligent mics with lots of buttons on, works absolutely uh, with no problems at all. Um, this box in to its right is an aerial switch box because I've got quite a few rigs um, in one form or another. This allows me to connect any of my uh, VHF aerials to the rig and that includes the Z-Match so I can select the Z-match on um, six, four or two meters. And I've also got a variety of rotatable beams up on the roof, which come through this box as well. Uh, the switches are heavy duty ceramic switches, but they're made with a microstrip like construction because there's a metal plate in front and behind of each switch wafer so that they look as close as you can get to a microstrip transmission line. And that makes quite a big difference to the uh, attenuation. What else have we got? Um, there's an SB101, which has been specially modified for top band. Um, and that was a real pig of a job because I had to add an extra position to the entire band switch. So the whole unit had to be taken apart, which uh, was a, a week of days and evenings work some years back. 
Uh, this is a, an SB310, which was a shortwave listeners receiver, being completely rebuilt, uses 7360 beam deflection mixers. Performance is extremely good. Uh, IF rejection is close to 100 dB. In fact, if I put um, several milliwatts of 3.395 in, I can't hear it coming through into the rest of the, uh, the IF strip. So that, that works very well. This is an SB401. These two provide full break-in, as I'm uh, primarily a CW operator. Um, and this is an SB401, which is an HF band's Heathkit transceiver with, again, top band added. So I can do all the six major bands on that, but I can't do the work bands. The receiver does cover the work bands. Um, I think that's probably all some of my old professional test gear that I used to make many, many years ago when I worked for myself for a while before I went back to a proper job that paid. Um, and the towards the lower right is a, a synthesized communication receiver that I was involved in the design of um, in the very early 1970s. So um, that's the Radio Shack that I have at the moment. Uh, this photograph is 2016, so there have been one or two changes. The, I've still got the, um, uh, the IC7400, uh, which I find is a very nice piece of kit, and I've recently added an IC910 with 23 SEMs on. So I do have some commercial gear as well as my own homemade stuff. The test bench. Um, Again, this photograph is very slightly out of date in that I don't have the Roden Swartz wave meter in the middle anymore. Um, but um, the Regal analyzer, I've got a very low noise HP generator, a very noisy Marconi generator, and then the more conventional test gear that I think most people have. I've got a 100 meg HP scope, an analog scope, and the Regal equivalent. I actually prefer the analog scope for many applications, although it's not quite as accurate. The Regal is nice for making accurate measurements, but the Regal loses lock when the signal amplitude goes down where the um, analog one doesn't. So that's quite nice. Uh, crystal activity meter, bought that for 50p, and it's absolutely invaluable as I have a very large crystal bank. Um, I've got an old um, CT, I think it's CT52, which was a World War II noise generator, and I have brought the noise diode out onto an external unit connected via a cable. So the noise generator head is very, very close to the socket that you can plug into your radio. Uh, bird through line and 100 watt dummy load, and uh, the oscillator top right for driving my Marconi Q meter. So Nice collection of test gear, particularly the HP generator, which is extremely low noise. So it's very useful for doing high performance receiver measurements. Uh, and it is of its vintage, one of the quietest generators that existed. Uh, sorry, no Bob, Bob Frank had a comment. Bob, Frank, what was your comment about the HP generator? If you come off mute. I think... Maybe yeah, uh, oh, there you are. Bob, was that the HP 8640B as in it's, boy? It's the one with the built-in stabilizer and the um, multiplier for one gigahertz. It's a very nice piece of kit. Abs absolutely. Have you had any problems with the timing circuit going awry? I haven't. I bought it from a calibration house about five years back so i paid quite a hefty premium for it to have a calibration certificate but they did a reasonable job at cleaning it all up before they sold it to me so i've not had any complaints so far right I'd like I, another I've, one I've, <laughs> I've had i've had that see jen and i agree with you it's one of the things that that happens is that um frequency divider goes awry so you'll be half of what it really is sending out at least what it will show the other thing is the the plastic gears over time, if you let them set up, they will eventually crack. And a fellow in India is now turning and machining out brass gear replacement. So if you ever need that, bear in mind. But, Thank you. Yes, uh, I've read a number of the horror stories on what can go wrong inside. But touch wood so far, mine has been fine. And it is a lovely piece of kit to use. 
Absolutely. And, and I'm, I uh, kind of agree with you about the difference between the digital versus analog scopes. I have both in my workbench and each certainly has its place. Uh, very, very good. Thank you for the yep. presentation. Thank you very much. Um, right. That's it. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, we have got some more questions, Bob. So Richard, you had a comment and a question. Richard, do you want to, uh, do you want to go ahead? On mute. Yeah, hello, Bob. Um, noticing Hi. your uh, sort of basically floats of components, have you thought of using, or do you use sort of bits of scrap PCB or like a little squares glued onto the piece, onto your um, back plane as such, to uh, sort of rather than have things floating? Oh, um, I. Like those Manhattan Square things. Yes, I, I know what you mean. No, yes. the simple answer is no. I've, I've always tended to try and be quite careful. Um, and I don't keep a prototype for very long. So once I've established the circuit works, it generally gets taken apart because I have a limited uh, room. The, uh, the lady of the house who must be obeyed requires that I keep everything in one room. Otherwise, she gets uh, just a little bit uppity. So... Um, I tend not to keep things assembled for too long in order to keep the space down. But no, I've, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with um, uh, 18 gauge or 16 gauge wire stretched between components. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And we also have some comments from Tony as well. I think this is more about the, uh, the, the early question about um, carriers for, for um, service mount devices. Tony, did, did you want to jump in and make any, uh, make any comments? Is she being totally still on the call? Maybe not. Okay. Oh, no worries. Tony's got problem with his microphone. Okay. Anybody else got any, um, got any questions at all for Bob before we uh, wrap things up? No. This doesn't appear so. Okay. Well, look, Bob, that was an excellent talk once again. Thank you very, very much. I think everyone got something from that. And uh, yeah, we'd like to thank you very much for, for once again, um, an excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah, good one, Bob. Thanks, Martin. And we'll give you a virtual, virtual clap <laughs> via Zoom. <laughs> I'll turn off the screen sharing. <laughs> there you go. Right, okay. there we are. Okay. If, if no one's got any other questions, guys. then we'll wrap things up. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for all the questions. I think that was a really good session and uh, a really good attendance as well. So uh, thank you, guys, and uh, we'll see you all next time. The next one, by the way, we've got uh, John, who is in the middle of the screen, on my screen at least, talking to us about uh, exams and uh, exam technique, that sort of thing. So uh, see you all next time. Thank you all very much. Thanks, yeah. Bob. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Bob. Thanks a lot for that. Cheers.